There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still in all of life's ebb and flow. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Yeovil Vineyard Church to our online service. I'm Karen. This is my husband, John. Hello. Welcome. If you're visiting us today, then you are especially welcome. And we really hope that you feel at home and comfortable with us this morning. So we're going to start our, our worship with about 20 minutes of singing. So please feel free to, to join in or just sit back and listen to the music. Uh, and then we'll bring a talk on the topic of the day, followed again by a worship song. So you can just reflect on what's been said. At the end, please don't rush away. There's all the information that you need to connect with us. As I said, if you are visiting, please um, keep those details and we'd love to hear from you. Hello, welcome to our Pentecost Sunday service. Uh, we have a guest speaker today and we're, we're really pleased to welcome back Nigel Morris, uh, who's a pastor in the US, but um, came to talk to us in 2015. So we're excited to hear what he has to share with us today on Pentecost Sunday. Before that, I'm going to read a Bible verse and pray, and then hand over to the band who will be leading us in our sung worship. So for our verse, I've chosen Joel 2, starting at verse 28 uh, to 32, the first half of that verse. Um, and this is a prophecy about the coming of the Holy Spirit, and this was written hundreds of years before Jesus was born, and, and it's pretty powerful. So Joel 2, 28 to the first half of 32. Then after doing all those things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. In those days, I'll pour out my spirit even on servants, men and women alike. And I will cause wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke, the sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before the great and terrible day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Pentecost Sunday. We thank you that you gave us your spirit and you gave it to everyone, men, women, servants, Jews, Gentiles, that there, there was no distinction. And we pray that we will embrace that. We ask for dreams and visions and prophecy, and we pray that we would open our eyes and ears and hearts to see what your will is for each one of us as we go out into the world, that we would hear your voice and that we would be your hands, Lord. And as we hear from Nigel today, we ask that you bless his words and that they would speak to each one of us individually. You would have a message for each one of us. Thank you for all you do for us, Lord. Amen.
there's nothing worth more will ever come close nothing can compare
your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, out we invite your presence you are welcome here wherever you are speak out holy spirit you are welcome here your goodness your wholeness your love your healing your presence the kingdom of god you are welcome here we say more of you more of you with us, more of you around us, more of you in us. You're so very welcome. Help us open up the parts of us that need opening up, that you may have your rightful place in us more. That we might live a, a life of worship back to you in love for the extravagance you have shown us. Amen. Greetings, good morning from sunny California, from the Tehachapi Mountain Vineyard. Where's that, you ask? Ask Hendrik, I say. I'm very aware, I'm very aware today is Pentecost Sunday. And so I want to take this opportunity to speak about the Holy Spirit and his visitation, but from a slightly different angle than what might be considered a typical message on such a day as this. I wonder, what's your earliest childhood memory? I can date mine back to 1953. It's the scene which marked a whole new beginning for me. I could see myself neat and tidy for once, meticulously, painstakingly tying my own shoelaces, a new achievement of which I was very, very proud. I was five years old, and it was my very first day at primary school. A whole new chapter was beginning, was unfolding. Now, the only reason I mention this is because that very same year, 1953, thousands of miles away in the heart of Africa, God chose to begin a brand new chapter in the life of his church by pouring out his spirit on an area then known as the Belgian Congo. So this morning, and to do things a little differently, as I've mentioned, I want to tell you a little bit about that great move of God. Hopefully, you'll find it encouraging. I always find it encouraging. Author, teacher, speaker, R.T. Kendall once wrote this. Nothing is more needed today than the powerful presence of God active in the people of God. 
the story of expectant people visited by God in revival power has much to teach us about the importance of handling such holy things with care, weighing all things by the standard of Scripture while being prepared unconditionally for God, the Holy Spirit, to deal with us as he wills. R.T. wrote that endorsement back in 1991 for a book about the 53 revival in the Congo. It was originally entitled, This Is That, but later reprinted as The Spirit of Revival. And I believe R.T.'s words carry as much weight for today's church as they did back then. R.T. pastored and preached in Westminster Chapel in London for 25 years, the very same pulpit that was once occupied by the great Welsh preacher, David Martin Lloyd-Jones, for 30 years prior. Let me read you what Lloyd-Jones considered the ultimate prayer in connection with revival from Isaiah 64, verses 1 through 3. It begins with a simple two-letter word, O, O-H, O. Lloyd-Jones said there was no word more expressive of longing than that little word, oh. It expresses the thirst of deep desire. It's the cry of a man at the end of his resources, waiting, looking, longing after God. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down that the mountains might quake at your presence, as fire kindles the brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things, which we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. The personal pronouns you, and your occur some eight times in these three short verses, while the word presence occurs three times. What's so significant about that seemingly mundane fact is that it reminds us that true revival is always, always about God. It's God moving, God working, God pouring out his spirit and coming down, so to speak, in visitation. You can't work it up, summon it up, or conjure it up. It's something God does. And his coming is always characterized by this word, presence. The tangible, manifest presence of God permeates everything. God is real. God is near. God is particularly here when revival comes. Revival then is a sovereign work of God. There are things which in a sense you can do by way of preparation. Take prayer, for example. Every genuine revival has always been preceded by or ushered in by prayer in some shape or fashion. An individual or individuals perhaps have sometimes prayed for years and suddenly find they have a burden for prayer like they've never experienced before. And you could make the argument that even that burden comes from God a burden which they cannot shake off. It, of, it often intensifies to the point where they feel they can take no more. And then suddenly, revival breaks out. The whole thing is like some kind of birthing process. More often than not, the church is going through desperate and hard times. A general apathy toward the things of God frequently exists. That was certainly the case in the Congo. From 1914 onwards, a gospel witness had been established among, amongst numerous tribes in an area of some 400 miles long and 250 miles broad at its widest part. 
There were 50, 50 missionaries in 10 centers and an indigenous African church numbering many thousands, worshiping in several hundred villages under the leadership of their own elders. Although people were coming to Christ, there was a growing dissatisfaction among the missionaries with the religious status quo. There must be more than this. There has to be more than this. David Davis, David Davis, a good Welsh name and a good Welsh missionary was there at the time and he put it like this. He spoke about his house in the north where the heat was really, really dry. Severe, scorching winds were normal. It's a bit like Tehachapi, actually. His house was surrounded by a beautiful, lush, green lawn until the dry season came. The grass browned, then withered, and the wind blew everything away. All that was left was bone-dry earth, which split and formed huge cracks, some so big you could put your whole hand in them. Davis said, you would despair of ever seeing a green blade of grass ever again. That's often a picture of the church before revival. But then, toward the end of the rainy season, an early morning dew would form until the sun burnt it off. Gradually, very gradually, a miraculous green sheen began to coat the entire lawn area. And within a matter of weeks, the beautiful, lush green lawn would be back again, refreshed, exuding new life. That's a good picture of what God does when he comes in revival. Well, what might happen as a result of that type of visitation, as a result of his coming? Dr. Helen Rosevere, who was a missionary to the Congo between 1953 and 1973, gives us an idea of what it was like in those days of God's visitation. And she wrote these words. That last Friday evening in July 1953, I remember it as though it were yesterday, it was 7 p.m., a hundred of us were gathered for the weekly fellowship meeting in the Bible, Bible school hall in Mbambi, in the northeastern province of what was then the Belgium Congo, later Zaire, now again the Democratic Republic of Congo. Jack Scholes, leader of the team of 50 missionaries working across the province, had stood to lead in prayer. We had sung a hymn. And Jack began to share what he had witnessed of revival in the southern part of the mission area where he'd been visiting during the previous two weeks. Suddenly, everyone heard a fearful roar. The fearful roar of an approaching hurricane. Stewards moved around the hall, taking down the wooden shutters to prevent accidents that could occur if they were blown in. I glanced out into the night, she writes, expecting to see dark, scudding clouds, palm trees bending low to the ground, dust spirals rushing towards us. It simply wasn't there. The clear sky, upright palm trees silhouetted in the moonlight, all was still, utterly still. Yet the storm lanterns suspended from the central beam, the length of the hall, were shaking violently. The very building seemed to rock as though a rumbling earthquake was beginning to erupt. A noise of a mighty rushing wind filled the place. That sound familiar? All over the hall, people were down on the ground, crying out to God for mercy. Others were shaking violently, apparently uncontrollably. Here and there, a few were on their feet, their hands upraised, their faces radiant, praising God. Jack Scholl stood still, watching, 
praying and then moving among us, speaking quietly to one and then another of the leading elders, the pastors and the missionaries that were there. He said, just pray. Ask God to keep control. Allow the Holy Spirit freedom to act as he sees fit. Don't fear and don't interfere. All over the hall, a shattering conviction of sin was gripping hearts. Sin was suddenly seen as desperately sinful. People were moved to tears as they confessed their sin, such as Petty theft, jealousies, anger, coldness of heart, to name a few. But then, a sin was brought out into the open and laid at the foot of the cross, so to speak. An amazing joy flooded in. Singing started in great waves. Words made up as we sang. Each song praising God for Jesus. The 7 p.m. meeting would always be finished by 9 p.m., but many of us were still there at 2 a.m. Some stayed all night and all through Saturday and Saturday night. By Sunday, the news had spread of the Spirit's gracious visitation to the big church at Imbambi, and Christians began arriving from surrounding villages. Throughout the day, the Holy Spirit continued his wonderful work. Many were broken down under a conviction of sin and then led into a new realization of cleansing and forgiveness. By afternoon, joy. Joy of an extraordinary power and wonder filled the vast crowd, the singing, the radiant faces, arms upraised at every mention of the name of Jesus. What a day. And the revival swept on, village by village, over the whole region, through the ensuing months, the ensuing years. The church doubled its numbers and then tripled. Twelve years later, when civil war tore our country apart. The revived church had been prepared by God to withstand the onslaught of unbelievable horror and evil. In an interview, Rose Vere was asked what else was special about the ongoing effects of God's working. And she gave this example. There are a number of what we call fixations. Later, during the rebellion of 1964, three rebel soldiers came to my house. The middle soldier was the commander, and the one on his right had a spear, and the other had a gun slung over his shoulder. They demanded money from me, and when I refused, they got really mad, and the commander told the one on the right to strike me down. He raised his spear to drive it through me. And I just put my arm up to ward off the blow. Suddenly, I realized that nothing had happened. The man's arm was raised, and he was standing a yard away from me with a real hatred in his eyes. I've never seen such hatred. He obviously wanted to kill me, but he was rooted to the ground and couldn't move. The three men were fixed to the spot. And I said to them, I love this, that my God in me is greater than their God in them. I then backed through the door and crumpled in a heap. But I pulled myself together and made them coffee and took some of John's Gospels and talked to them about Jesus. They listened and then left. When asked about other signs, she said, I remember one time I was visiting a very sick wife of one of the pastors. I was driving through a dirt track and came to the top of a hill and suddenly saw a forest fire. The fire was at the village where we were going and it lit up the whole sky. We walked the last few miles, but as we got closer, I was struck by the fact that there was no noise. Well, that was strange. 
forest fires have an enormous, enormous roar, louder than a plane. As we got closer, there was also no heat. As we entered the village, only one house was ablaze, which was the pastor's house. But there were no people about. Again, this is strange because everyone would have been out to deal with the fire. Suddenly, there was a terrifying sense of awe. Oh, we went into the blazing house with flames everywhere, but nothing was burning. The people inside were praising the Lord. The pastor's wife had died, gone to be with Jesus. God's glory had truly come down on them. When asked how the rebellion in 64 Affected the, affected the move of the Spirit. She said, the rebellion came 12 years after the revival first hit us. It was a terrible and appalling time when something like a quarter of a million people were murdered out of a population of 15 million, many of them Christians. The revival made us ready for all this and carried us through the suffering. We didn't mind what happened to us because our hearts were so rooted in Jesus. When asked what she felt caused the fervor of revival fire to cool down, she said that over the years, the effect of Western, Western materialism was really damaging. She said, we live a very simple lifestyle all the money that came in as gift money was divided equally between everyone, between the team, whether it was a person who cleaned the house, the cook, the motor, the guy that fixed the cars, all were totally equal servants. But when radios arrived, remember radios? Everyone find out, found out how the rest of the world lived and wanted more. Also, salaries with different Differing pay scales came when independence arrived. When asked, were there any big lessons that we can learn from this remarkable visitation of God? She said, well, you can't live forever on the mountaintop. You have to come down into the valley to do the work. We contain, the doctor said, the tr treasure of the Lord Jesus it doesn't matter whether it's beautiful, thin chinaware or a cracked old earthen pot. What matters is the treasure within. The key thing is that God and God alone is glorified. She said, the revival was wonderful. I hope that I still live in the joy of it and that it burns in me forever. It's true that the manifest manifestations were there, even that they shamed shaped and changed us but the lasting effect was not to seek for more manifestations but rather a deep desire to follow Jesus. Revival gave us all an urgent desire and a hunger to seek the fruit of the Spirit rather than merely manifestations. The Spirit taught us to be gentler, more patient, less judgmental. He worked in us this desire to manifest the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, so to be more like Jesus in the process. The gifts, she said, by comparison, were a bit on the side, a bit on the periphery. Some of the lasting impressions of the revival by the Welsh missionary David Davis I referred to earlier were these, in no particular order. An absolutely overwhelming sense of God's presence. An absolutely overwhelming sense of God's presence. After revival, there was a brand new church and an exalting of the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ together with great tenderness, unity and love among the people. The sense of restoration of stolen property was so great that it became 
very real problem for the government to find space to put all the stolen tools that were returned by people who had worked on various government projects. They just ran out of space. Also, Davis was struck by one story of a woman who walked 160 miles through the forest just to ask forgiveness for harboring bitterness towards a lady. Prayer became a joy and a delight, not a chore. The whole church was moved, engaged in evangelism. I think that's pretty cool, huh? I do think it's worth mentioning that what was so different about this particular revival is that the missionaries and pastors never stopped teaching the Word of God throughout. They remained active and weren't afraid to address excess as and when it occurred, of course. As a result, God's Word literally became the Word of life for many. On this Pentecost Sunday, I hope you found this brief account encouraging, maybe even challenging. And I want to kind of wrap up with this. In Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 8, we read the following. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. The sound of their voices the doorposts and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Whenever God displays something of his glory, something of his splendor, something of his majesty and power. The effects on men and women, of course, are remarkably similar to Isaiah's experience in this passage. And as a result, they're left with the following. A gigantic vision of God, a deep awareness of their own sin, a profound experience of God's grace, of God's mercy, and a willingness to spend and be spent in God's service. This is what happened to Isaiah. This is what happened in the Belgian Congo, which begs the question, what might happen if we were to begin to pray, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Let me pray for you guys. Thank you, Lord, 
that you're not uh, frustrated or flummoxed by our flimsy technology. Thank you, Lord, for your love for, for us. I pray now, Spirit of God, that you would come and descend, as it were. You presence yourself on each one watching this morning, on this Pentecost Sunday. I pray for the vineyard there in Yeovil, and I, I, and I pray for other churches too, for a spirit of unity, and love, and a deferring to one another. I pray, Lord, for those watching that are struggling in any sense of the word, whether it's financially, uh, whether it's a physical thing, emotional thing, I pray that you would come now and bring healing to those who may be desperate for it. So in the name of Jesus, I speak healing to you. I speak life to you. I speak hope to you, especially where hope has drained out as it tends to do. So Lord, come and presence yourself. Come and be yourself in the hearts and the minds and the lives of these lovely people. And as you do what you do, Lord, we'll be sure to give you all the glory and all the honor because it's all yours. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Bless you guys. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of we. This watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus, pick it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. I find thy power in thine alone can change the leper's spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I Sin had left a crimson stain.
judgment made where every star 